uh, Ecclesiastes 11 and 1, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall towards the south or towards the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. That's, boy, that's deep right there. Wherever it falls, there it's going to be. I mean, that's just deep. I, I just, I really think the Lord has in, in stirred me for a very specific word for this church. You may not run and shout tonight. You may not do cartwheels for you. You may run, but you may run out of here. That's what you may do. But I really feel like pa pastor's job tonight is to help us understand the term, cast your bread upon the waters. Everybody say, my bread on the waters. Put your Bibles down because nothing good can happen if we don't pray and ask God's Spirit to come in. And I'm asking God specifically to help you partition your mind and leave Monday over in Monday and to leave Saturday back in Saturday and even this morning in this morning and just in this moment what God is speaking to the church for our benefit that we can be edified and encouraged Jesus, to not anoint our minds. God, illuminate your word. God, make it clear and applicable. God, for this season, you're speaking to the church words that are going to be a benefit to many souls. Help us tonight to do our part. And everybody say, that's me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Come on, to give your neighbor a fist bump and say, I'm glad you are here tonight. Y'all don't seem real glad. Maybe you remember some weeks ago. I, I'm not so vain, Brother Smotherman, to believe that anybody remembers anything I've ever preached, okay? Some people say, you know what I preached three years ago on a Tuesday night? No, okay? I'm not so vain as to think you remember what I said this morning, let alone three weeks ago. But I did preach what is called a conceptual message. It's a concept. Some weeks ago, maybe I start talking about it, you'll remember. And it was the concept of the imagination. That where God finally had to move in on humanity and seek to destroy mankind was not because we sinned, because they sinned in the garden. Not because they disobeyed, because men disobeyed multiple times over multiple generations before the flood. The Bible says when God was moved to action is when their imaginations became evil. In other words, everything they thought to create was evil. God knew their processor had become corrupt and going forward if he did not intervene. Every desire, passion, carnal pleasure would be the preeminent thought in their life. And that concept, I was trying to teach us how that it's important to allow God to shape our imagination that with man things are impossible, with God all things are possible, and we allow God to stretch our mind, things that seem intangible or unlikely become possible because it starts in the imagination. As a man or a woman thinketh, do y'all think in your heart? You really think where? I just make sure, just make sure, okay? Now, that was a concept. Tonight is going to be another concept, but I hope you can grab a hold of it. Was a kid, when I heard about cast your bread on the water, I said, uh-uh. Because I like me a good ham sandwich. Can, can I get a witness on that? Who's ever had soggy, wet bread? I, I remember years ago, my youth leader took me spelunking. That's caving. He thought it was a good activity for a high-energy teenage boy. And so he took me and a couple of guys, and we went caving. And we went down in this cave, and we went a mile underground, utter darkness, ice-cold water in places I never want to go back to again. 
and we got in the bottom of that cave. It's physical work. I was beat black and blue by the time I got out of that cave. It's work to get around them places. I thought to myself, if God had wanted us in here, he'd have put some steps in here. That's all I'm thinking. And we got in the bottom of the cave, and my youth worker said, the boys, don't worry about packing lunch. I'm going to pack a lunch. For the offered, by the time we got in the bottom of that dark cavern called Doc's Delight, Doc was crazy because it was no delight. Our youth leader opened up his backpack and said, here's your lunch, boys. He had made peanut butter and dill pickle sandwiches on wheat bread and water. He was too cheap to buy the Ziploc sandwich bags. He got the fold-over kind, and our sandwiches were soggy. Can I give you a word? When you're hungry enough, that may have been the best peanut butter and dill pickle sandwich I've ever I get tired of people saying, I'm just not spiritually hungry. When you get hungry enough, everything will sound good to you. You won't be so picky and finick. Now, I'm saying that for a reason. When I thought about cast your bread on the water, I thought about that caving experience and how naturally undesirable it is. But I, I really began to think that if you took a piece of bread and laid it, you're in the boat and you laid it on the water, Sister Stephanie, within a few minutes, it'll get to where it's not retrievable. It gets wet enough, and if you try to plunge your hand in and scoop it out, it's just going to fall apart, and it's really good for nothing. So if you take this metaphor to the extreme, I literally believe God's intent is take what you have and put it in a place where you can't retrieve it and allow God to by faith do something with it and although it looks lost our God is able to take what we give in faith that looks lost and he's able to return it the Bible goes on he said not just one fold not just two fold but he can return it seven fold how would, how would you like to take one Hawaiian sweet roll and throw it in the water and get seven back that's, that's the God I serve right there. Now, I don't, I don't want to get too bogged down, but I do want you to get this. Some translators say it wasn't literal bread, but that it was grain that you would use to make bread with. And the theory was, like on the banks of the Nile, after it flooded, it would leave great silt or sediment. And it would be muddy water on the banks. And so they didn't have tractors and plows. And so they would get in like a little flat bottom boat. And they would sled out in there. And they would throw their grain over the side and hit that muddy water. And then they would let the herd of goats come behind them and trample it. And it would push that seed or that grain down into the muddy bogs. And then you come back in so many days... And what looked like a lost seed now becomes a beautiful plant, and you've got a harvest, and you will reap if you faint not. Okay, I'm okay with that interpretation. But when I dug deeper on the bread, the grain that you would produce bread of, that wasn't surplus. That wasn't left over for next year's crop. When it says the bread, that, that is grain bread, that you have set aside to eat until there's another harvest. Can I say, how many times are we really only willing to invest out of our surplus? But this passage is really saying, don't just give out of your surplus. Give out of what you've already set aside as a necessity. See, I, if you look at this in context, I, I think... King Solomon is observing that God in his creation uh, does develop systems. I love God and the way he creates because he develops systems that if we honor those systems, he doesn't have to come back and recreate, but the creation continues to recycle or recoup or recover or renew itself. Even in how he created just a man and a woman, but they reproduce. And even though a generation dies, when the generation does what it's supposed to do, there'll be a new generation. He ain't creating new men every day. His original system of creation is still in the process of creating. That's why the word procreation, because God's already set up the system. Now, 
I'm going to bring it back around in just a second, but I had never seen this to just recently. When God said, let there be light, he didn't just put a bulb up there and it burned out in 90 days. He didn't put a battery-powered flashlight that we had to go find a new power source. When God created and said, let there be light, he created a light system that fed itself the energy. The sun is a supernova. That means in some ways it's imploding on itself, but as it implodes, it produces more light. And the more light it produces, the more it implodes on itself, and the more it implodes on itself, the more light it produces. I'm talking about better than renewable energy. It is sustainable energy because God created a system. How about God created plants and plant life? That is part of the ecosystem, ecology, and the natural. Isn't God good that when he created plants, the gas they let off when they breathe is carbon dioxide, excuse me, is oxygen. Now, what do we breathe? I'm going to tell you, Sister Cabana, I'm addicted to oxygen. Some things I can do without, but about three and a half minutes is about all I can do without oxygen. Isn't God good that he set up a system that we take the oxygen from the plants? But guess what? We breathe, and when it comes out of us and we exhale, what is toxin to us, when we talk to our plants, they flourish and grow because what they need is what? Carbon dioxide, which is what we exhale. And then they breathe it in, and they turn that crummy old toxin to us. It's life to them, and they exhale or expel more oxygen. God put a system. We take from it. And it takes from us. How about the water system? Isn't God good? That clouds get heavy. That's what this verse 3 is talking about, Ecclesiastes. That the clouds get full of rain. They get full of water. Who knows what humidity is? That's liquid oxygen, people. When you can drink the air, it's humid. And so the clouds get heavy. Who's ever walked outside and you can just smell rain? Okay. It's because there's a lot of moisture in the air. And when it gets to what's called a dew point, it's that tipping point where the temperature is right, where only the air can hold or sustain so much water. And when it tips over that point, it starts letting it go. Everybody say rain. So rain gets heavy with water, and then the rain is released, and it hits the ground, and it washes the ground, and it waters the ground, and then it flows into little brooks and streams and creeks and rivers and other tributaries, and then it flows into the muddy Mississippi, and then it goes in the Gulf of Mexico. And the sun shines on the bleak, uh, blue, deep blue sea. And it evaporates and it creates clouds and it comes over and turns into hurricanes and ups nine feet of rain in about six minutes, right? And it just, see, see, God could just leave water on the face of the earth, but water stagnant destroys, it kills, it's toxic. But God created a way that it, the sun can heat it up and it can evaporate and then it can be moved inland and it can fall on the ground and it can wash away all the dust and pollen and sediment and flow out in the sea and it can be caught up again. And it's that system, that cycle. When God said let there be light, it was a light system. When he had the water, it was a water system. When he had plenty, it was a plant system. Now, this is what I want you to get. It's very simple. I'm going to break it down in elementary measures where even Matt can get, Brother Matt can get it. Okay, you ready? Come on. You're from Maine. i just make sure you get this. Okay. Did y'all know that cows eat grass? Did y'all know that? If you put too many cows on too little land, they're going to be tromping in the mud. Because as long as there's grass, they're going to eat. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You will have a bare pasture if you don't move them around, okay? So cows feed on the grass, but then the cows drop fertilizer. Do you like the way I put Cows drop fertilizer. But guess what fertilizer does? It's toxins to the cow. But it's energy and growth and potential to the grass. So the fertilizer 
lands on the grass, the grass grows. Guess what happened? And then the cow comes and eats the grass. And then the cow drops the fertilizer and the fer- and on and on. See, God put systems. When he created, he said, I'm not going to come back every Monday and create a new man or every Tuesday and create new fish. He said, I'm going to create a system where it'll continually feed itself. Here's the problem. It'll That cycle will continue as long as you honor and obey God's natural law. And if you breach the law that God put in that cycle of nature, I didn't say the circle of life. I said the cycle, there is not a uh, mother nature. There is a father God. And he, I want to hit that. And so if we break God's natural law, a curse will come. Now, Pastor, I don't know if I believe that. Jesus saw a fig tree. And it had the big green leaves that indicated it was fruit bearing time. And Jesus went over and pulled back the leaf and he found no fig. And the Bible says he cursed it and it withered up. And it died. Now, did he curse it because he was hungry? I mean, Jesus could have turned stones into bread. He didn't curse it just because he's hungry. He cursed it because it was not producing. It was taking of the sun and the water and the soil, but it wasn't giving anything back. I want you to get this big concept here. Now, I don't know about you. Sometimes the only time I crave a Chick-fil-A is on Sunday. Anybody ever thought that? Who who likes Chick-fil-A besides me? Yeah. Oh, I, I feel the Shekinah just moved in here on that. Now, if you go to Chick-fil-A and you're hangry because you're hungry, now angry because they're closed on Sunday. You know, Jesus didn't curse that tree because he's hungry. That'd be kind of like you burning down Chick-fil-A because they're closed on Sunday. If you burn them down on Sunday, they're not going to be open back up on Monday. That'd be foolish, wouldn't it? So... Jesus wasn't having a tempter tantrum. He was setting a standard that his students, disciples that were following him could understand. If you're going to take in the system, the responsibility is you've got to give back to the system. That if you take and you don't give back, you've breached God's law. The cow eats the grass, but it don't give back the fertilizer. Or the cow gives all the fertilizer and the grass don't... Give back to the cow. You see how it breaches the cycle? And it, it, it'll, it'll bring a curse. It, it, the ground will either be all muddy or the cows will be all dead. Okay, it's got, got to work in harmony. Now, you think I'm taking an abstract verse out of context. How about this? There was another passage that says this is a tree and it's been around a long time and it's not bearing any fruit. Why let it cumber the ground? Why let it be a strain on the ground? Be better to do what? Cut it down. Cut it down. Why are you feeding it? Why are you letting it consume water? Why are you letting it take your time? Just cut it down. Now, can I say this? You don't have to have graduated from Bible college to understand you feed what's feeding you. You bless what's blessing you. You take care of what's taking care of you. You give to what's giving to you. I thought I'd get one amen on that. I mean, if we were back in the old farm days and we got our milk from the cow, I'm going to take care of the cow because I like milk on my cereal. Can I get a witness? I, I'm going to make sure nobody messes with the cow. I'm going to make sure the cow's got hay. I'm going to make sure the cow has been milked. I'm going to make sure it gets up in the barn when the storms come. I'm going to make sure it's got all the drinking water because well, I want some milk. I don't expect to go harvest milk from a cow that I haven't been taking care of. When it takes care of me with the milk, I'm going to take care of it with hay and water and, and shelter. Makes sense. Okay. First Timothy 5 and 18 says you can't muzzle the ox while treading the grain. If it's working, you got to take care. If it's working for you, you got to take care of it. It goes on to say the worker deserves his wages. Now I'm going to drill down on this for just a second. Is everybody with me? Anybody mad at me? Okay, good. You'll get there. Who's ever been to a restaurant? Okay. Now, re- 
restaurants want to make a profit. If they don't make a profit, they're not going to be open long. Amen? But they don't expect you to pay the check that's on somebody else's table. Amen. I, I went to Waffle House earlier this year, and I just had, I think, a little sandwich and a, and a glass of tea. And they brought me my check, and it was $49.14. I said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's wrong? What's wrong? I said, are you sure this my Yeah, it's your ticket. It's got my name on the back. I said, I know your name. It's the total that I got a problem with. Oh, I'm sorry. I gave you this for this, this table of fours. I said, yes, what I thought. And once she realized it wasn't the food I ate, it was no longer considered my ticket. They don't expect you to pay tickets at tables where you didn't eat. But if you eat, they expect you to pay for what you ate. And is that reasonable? Is that reasonable? Okay. Now, I love Galatians chapter 6 verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. A man will reap what he sows. I like to put an addendum on that. I'm not adding to the word. I'm bringing clarity. I want to make the difference there. You will reap what you sow, but you could deduce that you'll also not reap what you don't sow. That seems reasonable, doesn't it? Okay. If you don't sow it, I don't expect to reap it. Now, I love the phraseology there. God is not mocked. That's lost something in this culture, but uh, I had a situation years ago working in a, in a restaurant. Some guys figured out how to scam the register, and they would load their trays up with food, and they would walk in there, and they would pay pennies on the dollar, and it created a sense of contempt. They laughed at, oh, look what we're getting away with. Ha, ha, ha. Manager don't know what we're doing. We're eating big and paying 30 cents for it. And it caused them to lose respect, even though the manager didn't do anything wrong, lost respect for him. Can I tell you something? Just because they got away with it on Monday and got away with it on Tuesday and got away with it on Wednesday, it's not if, it's when the man in charge runs an inventory and realizes we got a whole lot more product going out of the restaurant than we got money coming in the till. And it caused him to sharpen his eyes and he laid a trap and he caught those two guys and he summarily fired them. Okay, you think you're getting away with something? I promise you, God is keeping a record. If He says you can't give a cup of cold water to a prophet, and me not take a record of it, that also tells you the times you didn't do what God expects you to do. He's keeping a record of that also. Man, it's quiet in here. Just because it seems like you're pulling the wool over God's eyes don't mean God's deceived. just means he's not said nothing yet. I used to tell my kids, don't mistake uh, my meekness for weakness. Don't assume because I didn't say nothing, I didn't see something. I'm just biding my time, waiting for the appropriate time. You're not going to get away with cheating God's system. He's established over and over again the balance, the, the cyclical nature that we do our part and then another part of nature does this part and then it comes back to us just like by faith. Throwing your bread on the water, you no longer is tangible to you. You can't scoop it back up, but you see it, but you let it go and trust that God's going to return it to you some way, somehow. It don't make sense. Sister Stephanie, I, I can't run my hand there. I can't pick it back up. I can't turn it into a sandwich. And if I did, I probably wouldn't want to eat it. But by faith. And this is where I want you to get today. He says, you will reap what you sow. You can't sow wild oats and reap sweet corn. Anybody ever been on a farm? Y'all know what I'm talking about? You sow okra, what you going to reap? Tomatoes? You're going to reap okra. You sow wild oats, what you going to reap? Oh, I sowed some wild oats, but God forgave me. But you may reap them through your children and your grandchildren. You can't sow greed and reap blessing. You can't sow drama and reap peace. You can't sow hate 
and anger and reap friendship. Doesn't work that way. But I want you to know we have encouragement. And it's found in Luke's Gospel chapter 6, verse 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Doesn't say you have to twist God's arm. Doesn't tell him, doesn't say you have to be a member of any organization. You don't have to have a preacher's license. It says, if you give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men. I believe God can cause you to find favor in places that you don't necessarily have earned favor. He can cause men to give into your bosom, for with the same measure that you meet, with all, it shall be measured to you again. In other words, if you give sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. But if you sow in an extreme fashion, you're going to reap in an extreme fashion. Now, let's make it about relationships for a minute. Anybody in a relationship? Julie, are we in a relationship? Maybe. Okay, good. Don't make sure. Let's use the husband and wife as an example. Okay. Husbands and wives. And I have people come to me, and, and I'll be honest with you, the worst are men. Whiner babies. But she just ain't doing me right, and she ain't listening to me, and she's not submitting. If a man comes to me and tells me how his wife's submitting, I'm thinking he's given her some good reasons for her not to it's, submit. There's something about his nature she don't trust. He's done some things to challenge that trust. And can I tell you, if you have to intimidate your spouse to submit, that is not submission. That's intimidation. Submission is where they have the ability not to submit, but they choose to. They've got to feel love, and they've got to feel trust. And if you violate those, it's going to be hard. Boy, it's real quiet in here now. Now, thank you. Yeah, she's on me. I thought she was on my side. She's just on me. That's, that's the difference. Okay. Now, let me say it this way. He's complaining, but then you dig a little deeper, and I say, well, are you investing in the relationship like you should? Because remember, God puts systems in place. And the natural byproduct of a right relationship between a husband and wife is children and grandchildren. I wish we'd skip straight to grandchildren, but we did. And we started with children, and then we upgraded and got us some grandchildren. Come. They're probably watching, and I better be good. And I ask her, well, he says you're not submitted. And she says, well, there's a good reason for that. Well, why is that? She says, well, you would think when he got a day off, he would spend it with me. But he's on the golf course, or he's hanging out with his buddies, or he's fishing, or he's a bar fly, or he's this, or he's that. She says, I thought when he got that bonus, if he was going to get anybody a ring, he'd get me a ring. If he had a free evening and $50, I thought if he's going to take anybody to dinner, it'd be take me to dinner. But, amen. Going back to concept again. Do you understand that I'm ashamed to tell you that there are men that are wanting to sow in one field and reap in another? You think because you put 90 hours in at work, you're going, you have a right to have this perfect family. But if you don't sow into the family and into the wife and into the kids, why would you expect to reap a harvest of godly good wife and godly good kids? Remember, we're talking about home improvements this month. You working hard on your job does not excuse your responsibility in that relationship. Because you're going to reap what you sow. And if you don't keep the balance right between what you're taking from the relationship versus what you're putting in the relationship, don't be surprised if it's cursed. Remember, Jesus cursed a fig tree because it was taken and not given. Don't be surprised if your actions are cursing your own marriage when you don't invest. Your kids get grown and they don't have anything to do with you. It could be because at the appropriate season you didn't invest. Man, it's quiet in here. I feel it strong tonight. We need to realize that God put a system 
in place. And we cannot breach the system. We can't sow in one pasture and reap in another. We can't sow in one way and reap in another way. God is asking us, what are you doing to feed what's feeding you? What are you doing to take care of what's taking care of you? What are you doing to bless what is blessing you? I'm going to tell you what, if I find the goose that lays a golden egg, I'm going to keep that goose nearby. I'm going to give him my best. I was going to say my goose down pillow, but he probably not like that. He that cannibalism with pillows. I don't like that. I'm going to give him my best. And there's something better than a, a goose that lays the golden egg, and that's a godly children or godly spouse or a right relationship with God or a local church that loves you. There are things that invest in us and bless us that we need to bless back into. Now, who in here has ever had somebody in your family crazy enough to want to bring a pet home? Don't you hate them pet people? I don't hate them, but I see the pet as a responsibility. We're, we're getting a pet. No, Daddy, it's my cat. It's my dog. It's my goldfish. But who's going to walk it? Oh, I know right now, I know right now it's yours and you're going to do it. But eventually it's going to be your mom's job. She's going to be cleaning the litter box. And when she's busy, who's going to take him to the vet? You're looking at him. Who's going to pay the bill? See, when you take on anything living, anything living has to be fed. Say that with me. If it's living, it's got to be fed. If you take anything living, it's going to require your effort of feeding. If it's a dog, if it's a fish, if it's a cat, if it's a kid, if it's a plant, anything living. Now, can I ask a question? Said all that to bring us to this. If we understand that about animals and their system, that you, you've got to invest and give to keep the cycle to be obedient. If you understand that with plants, that you can't do all the taking without giving. You plant in the same field year after year, and you don't replenish the soil with nitrogen and, and natural things that it requires to grow. You'll deplete the soil, and it won't produce anything. If we understand that about animals and plants and children and even relationships and even how businesses need to make a profit, if we can understand about this, those things, how come we can't understand that about our local church? That if your local church is investing in you and encouraging you and preaching you and you're being fed, you're being blessed, you're being taken care of, just as sure as you know you're going to have a ticket on your table when you eat at the restaurant and you'll have to pay a bill if you've eaten, if you've eaten from this sacred desk and been fed. Remember what it said. Cast your bread upon the water. It does not mean what is your surplus savings or discretionary spending. That really means from the level of your necessity. It's basically saying we've got to take care of what's taking care of us, whether we think we have it to give or not. This is good preaching. If the church is feeding you and encouraging you and providing for you spiritually and giving you guidance and spiritual covering, you've got to cast your bread on the water. Take what you have and by faith, trust. And guess what? I still believe Luke chapter 6, verse 38, that if you give, it will be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. David said, I was young, I'm now old, but I've been faithful in giving, and I found out one thing. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Well, I always get these examples thrown at me. What about people on fixed income? I don't necessarily know who gives what, but I can tell you what, some of our most faithful givers here are the people that are on a fixed income with no disposable aspect. They give faithfully and they give consistently. Don't tell me that if you're on a fixed income, you can't give. Because I got too many examples of people that have made up their mind. Now, can, can I stop and give an infomercial? I have a good friend of mine that shared with me recently that he's been pastoring 40 years. And he said, when I came to the Lord, 
He said, I came to the Lord. I was making $7,000 a year. Does that seem like a lot of money to y'all? Okay. 40 years ago, it probably was more than it is now, but it still wasn't a lot of money. It was just enough money to starve on. He said, when I came to the Lord, I wished I had a testimony to say that God delivered me from drugs and alcohol or delivered me from pornography or did some great thing that I had some stronghold or addiction that God set me free from. He said, I'm ashamed to tell you, even though I was raised in church, but when I gave my heart to the Lord, my biggest struggle wasn't giving up drugs, wasn't giving up wild women, wasn't giving up pornography. It was literally learning to be a giver. He said, that was, it was a, I mean, it about took my soul. And he says, we went to church, and our pastor talked about giving. He didn't give an amount. He didn't give a percentage. He said, you need to be a giver to be blessed. He read to them Luke chapter 6, verse 38, and then he prayed. And he said, I almost told my wife on the ride home from church, we're going to find us a new church. He said, that message just made me so mad. It just hurt my feelings. They're all about the money, those big money grabbers. That's all church is good for us. Take our money. And he said on the ride home, he said, I was trying to find the words. And we got home and my wife fixing some leftovers for lunch. He said something like Franks and beans, nothing glamorous because we were living on $7,000 a year. And he said, you know, basically we had about $700 a month to run the house on. Guys, that's a tight budget, okay? And he said, I was fixing to work up my courage to say, we need to find a new church. I didn't like that message this morning. And my wife said, can I talk to you just a second? And he says, well, sure, honey, go ahead. And she says, I just want you to know, I really love pastor's sermon this morning. And the Lord's been dealing with my heart. And I really feel like we need to give. He said, bro, I about lost the salvation I just found. He said, I about, he said, my face turned red. What do you mean? We got $700. Does God really need our $700? Does he need our tithe off $700 that bad? She says, no, we need by faith to cast our bread where we see where it went and we can't reach and get it. And if we did, it would disintegrate. But trust that God's going to return it back to us. Because remember, it's a cycle. It's a system. You give, he multiplies it and gives back. You get. And he said, I compromised with her. She says, he, she said, that'd be about $70 we, we need to write a check for. Can I write a check for He said, how about 35 She says, how about 40 And so they agreed on $40. And he said, we wrote that check for $40. And we got to the first of the next month, and I got my once a month check. This is a true, factual, I can take you to the guy story. He said, she came to him and said, honey, can I go ahead and write our tithe check for this month for $70? He said, no, wait a minute. Last month was an experiment. And we lived through your extreme request. And we are not going bankrupt yet, but let's don't push our luck. And she says, but you know what, honey? For the last several years, we've always had more month than we've had money. And she said, for the first time, after giving $40, we finished the month and all the bills was paid and we had a little left over. He said, how about 45? She said, how about 70? And that's the end of the subject. Yes, dear. He submitted. She wrote the check. He said, that was about March. He said, we got through the rest of that year paying that same amount. He said, I'd love to tell you Ed McMahon showed up on my front porch and we won $250,000. I'd love to tell you a great aunt or uncle passed away and left us a bunch of money or that somebody gave us a house. He said, I can tell you this. He said, me giving that $70 a month at the end of the year, every bill was paid. 
and we had about $700 in a savings account we had never... He said, it, it wasn't the million dollars. It's that when we trusted God in the little things, when we became faithful in the little things. He, he said, the God we serve, he, he may not open the window of heaven and pour you out thousands of dollars. He may not even give you a raise, but he'll take what you got and make it go further and cover things it would never cover. See, I, I promise you I haven't lost my way. God's got a system. And when we cheat the system, the byproduct often is a curse. That's why the Bible says a man who does not give in obedience to Scripture, it doesn't say he's naughty. It doesn't say he needs to try harder. He says, would a man rob God? He is breaking God's natural law of the harvest. And when you break the law, guess what? If you're not feeding what's feeding you... God can't bless it and multiply it if you don't put it in his hands. If you don't throw your bread on the water by faith, God can't increase what you don't put in there. Who would like to have a 40-fold blessing right now? What's 40 times zero, though? If you put nothing in, he, it don't matter how, he can do it a thousand. I'm going to a thousand times bless what you gave because I know you gave nothing. Here we go. I love what Paul says in Corinthians. He says, let every man bear his own burden. That means pay his own way. Let's talk about levels for just a second, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you respond. Levels. You cannot be a 60-fold taker and a 20-fold giver. I'm asking a question. Who in here has got people in your life that you hate to see them coming? Besides me, is there anybody else you hate to see coming? Because you know in your relationship, the only time you see from them or hear from them is when they want something, when they need something. <clears throat> I have been involved in North American missions for the Tennessee district for about 10 years. The biggest hurdle I've tried to clear is hear pastors say, the only time we hear from the North American missions department is when they want money. And I agree. You need, if you're going to have a relationship, it's got to be more than about gimme, gimme, gimme. Be honest. If you've got people they say, man, I don't know why we can't be friends. I don't know why they're not close. I don't know why they don't call me. It's because probably in the relationship, you're taking way more than you're giving. And people will bear that for a while. But after a while, you keep taking, 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 and there's no giving, giving, giving. There's a natural process, a natural law of resentment. And I believe God can look at things the same way, that the only time he hears from us, And it's all gimme, gimme, gimme. Let me tell you what, the fruit of our lips praise is what God's looking for. Do you know what fruit is? It's the byproduct of a system. It's because when we've been in the Word and we've looked around and realized, hey, I've had a bad day, but the lady I'm talking to just got diagnosed with cancer, so my headache ain't that big a deal compared to that lady. Lord, you are good and your mercies endure for. When we praise God with the fruit of our lips, God responds to that. The Bible says where we two or three are gathered in his name, the implication is they're lifting up his name. He is in the midst. When we're not just gimme, 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 but we're giving God praise and glory and honor, he responds to that. But don't be surprised when it's all about you and you're not giving of your time and giving of your talents and giving of your praise and giving of your resources. Don't be surprised if God's at arm. Oh, Lord, here they come again. Put your hand on your wallet, Lord. Can I, can I be really transparent? Over the years of pastoring, I have had to, if I have a little cash on me, I don't care a lot of cash, but if I have a little cash on me, I keep money in two pockets. One pocket I call my petty cash. One pocket I call my emergency fund. You know, in case I have a blowout tire, in case the battery goes dead, I need a little money just in case, because sure as the world you get caught in those situations that only take cash, right? So I keep a little cash. And then I have people, oh, you're a pastor. Could you help me? I need some money. I need some money. I need to pay my hotel bill. I need to do that. I need to do that. Right? So I've got money in both pockets. Now, there's been times that I was going to reach in my petty cash, and the Lord says, reach in your, your savings. Re by faith, cast your bread on the water. 
When the Lord tells me to do that, if it hair lips the devil, there's been a few times I've had to apologize. I said, Julie, I know that money you knew I had in my wallet, but the Lord told me to give it to so-and-so, and I just gave it. And she's like, no problem, no problem, no problem. She's never, never. She's always supported when the Lord, she knows when I say the Lord told me something, the Lord has told me something. And for me to turn a loose of Ben Franklin and Ulysses S. Grant, and nobody's got a gun out, you know that's the Holy Ghost. You tell me you love God by how loud you shout, but I know how much people love God by how much they give. It is God's system. Now, let me close with this. Any plant people, house plants, who's got house plants? Anybody here? Jill Jill and I have black thumbs. We can kill any, I, I, I can kill everything but poison ivy. It flourishes around me, poison ivy. If you're a plant person, raise your hand. I want to see who you are. I want to talk to you after church. Plant people. Oh, I knew you were. I knew you were. Lois, are you a plant person? Okay. Yeah. My grandmother Kraft, man, she had the greenest thumb. She could take weeds and turn them into roses. She just, she had the gift. But do you know how she did it? Every morning and every evening, she tooled around her yard and ministered to every plant she had. She had these praying hands. You ever seen praying hands, the plant? She'd been in the hospital and somebody sent that to her. And in the evening time, those hands roll up. You've seen those? But when the sun's out, they'll lay out and they got crimson streaks right down the middle. Oh, they're beautiful, praying hands. And she had uh, four o'clocks. At four o'clock every day, these little yellow flowers, they'd pop open. And then by the time the sun went down, they'd close again. And she had orchids and she had elephant ears and she had other sunflowers. You name it, she had it. Every morning and every evening, Brother Ira, she would work her way around the yard. She would see an insect or a bug. Ooh, I got to put some poison on that one. She, she would see a, a, a vine growing up that's going to choke it out. She'd pull that weed out. She'd see those little things growing at the bottom. They're called suckers. She'd rip them off. She'd, I'd say, Mama, that's living. That's good. That's green. She says, no, honey, it's just going to suck the nutrients away, and it'll keep it from producing fruit. She would prune. She would talk to. She would put a stake in it. She would take a piece of twine and tie it up to the fence. Whatever it needed. She said, Daddy. That's what she called my granny. She said, Daddy, bring the hose. They need water. She would potted plants. She'd give them a quarter or three-quarter turn. Whatever they needed, what sun they needed. And she just added soil to them. Had little uh, fertilizer sticks. Whatever they needed. She worked them morning and night. And that's why when you walked up on her property, man, she had beautiful, rare, almost exotic plants and flowers everywhere. Do you know why I don't? I can kill grass, guys. I'm telling you. I can kill Johnson grass. That's a weed. Do you know why it doesn't grow for me? Because I want to bebop around about once a month. Oh, the poor little plant. Just noticed you. Okay, let me move you closer to the window. And that one side's facing the window for 30 days. Oh, I forgot to fertilize it last week. So I double up on the fertilizer and I burn it up. But this, I want you to get this. I have forgotten to water it for weeks. But I'm going to make up for it because I'm going to give it a month's supply of water at one time. And then I wonder why my plant is dead. I burned it up with fertilizer. I thirsted it out and then I drowned it. Right? I burned up one side and then depleted the other side because it didn't get no sun. Right? Right? Now you're laughing. But how many people think they can come to church once a month? They can give a little here and there. Can I tell you something? You can't come once in a while and give every now and again and pray at random and read your Bible once or twice a month and expect you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and demon-free. If you want to be strong in the Lord, if you want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, if you want to endure to the end, if you want to stay part of the system that God set up and be blessed and taken care of, you got to invest consistently. Now, I'm going to close with a question. 
They taught us in Bible college to never do this. But this isn't the first time I ignored what I learned from my professors, okay? Let me ask you a question. Cause a little soul searching. I don't, I don't feel compelled for an altar call tonight. I don't feel compelled to ask you to come and pray. I, I want you to leave pondering this question. Here it is. What are you underfunding but overexpecting from? What are you underfunding but overexpecting? You put little investment in your spiritual health, but you expect to be Mike Tyson and the Holy Ghost. I wished I could go to the gym once and look like Lou Ferrigno. But if I go to the gym once, I'm going to look like Pee Wee Herman. Right? It's not that I've been to the gym. It's that I went to the gym on Monday and I went to the gym on Tuesday. I went to the gym. It's not that I, I, I think I'm going to be the next N.A. Urshan or, or, or the next uh, T.F. Tenney. But T.F. Tenney didn't become T.F. Tenney because he prayed one time. T.F. Tenney became T.F. Tenney because every day he bent his knee in prayer and put his nose in the book and he heard God's voice and he made regular investments. He fed what was feeding him. He took care of what was taking care of him and he blessed what was blessing him. Can I say, if you're not getting out of the spirit and out of the things of God that you would like to get, Maybe you're not investing enough in the things of God. About this time last year, I got bit by the bluegrass bug. I supposed myself to be a bluegrass musician. I call myself a bluegrass magician now. And I purchased what is known as a resonance guitar, also known as a dobro. Who's ever seen a dobro resonance guitar? And I've had it almost a year, and I can play about two or three licks on it. I can chord some things. Now, <clears throat> did they send me a defective dobro? Is it not the will of God? Am I too dumb? Don't answer that or answer it carefully. It, do I seem to have a lack of intelligence that I could not learn to play the dobro? What is the problem? Why would I expect myself to be proficient in something that I have not sown or invested into it that I could? Who in here would like to be a better Christ follower? Do you think it's the will of God that you not be? Do you think it's impossible for you? No. But if you're not, could it be that you have not invested the time necessary? I told you tonight was going to be a concept. Remember this. When God creates something, he creates systems. I've made up my mind. I've got to take some or I can't survive. I need some oxygen. Can I get a witness? I need some water. I need some light. I need some food. But I'm not going to be just a taker. I'm going to be a taker and a giver. I need God's grace and mercy. But I need to expend grace and mercy to others. I need God to lead and guide me. But I need to lead and guide others. I need God to teach me the ways of righteousness. But I need to teach transgressors his ways. It's not just all in me. It's through me. In and back. Jesus tonight. Thank you for these wonderful people. God, I am not very talented, but God, your spirit is able to take your word and penetrate our hearts and our minds. God, let this lesson be part of our thinking process this week that we evaluate our attitudes and our actions. God, let us ask, Lord, am I funding the things that feed me like I should? Or am I over expecting? 
for the amount of investment I've put in it. Help me to invest in my own spiritual well-being, that your word is to feed my soul, your spirit is to lead and guide me into all truth, and your heaven is open for my prayers, and you will respond. And if I give, you will give back, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, for your system is to give as good as you receive. Help us to understand your way. And everybody say, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You're dismissed tonight. Don't forget, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, go with God. Oh, I forgot.